Good afternoon, I'm Joe Cerami. I'm the director of the Public Service Leadership Program. This is our last academic year conversation in leadership uh, with our very own Dean Ryan Crocker. Uh, we, we've done this in past years uh, for two reasons. One is for you to have opportunities to ask questions of the Dean, and the second for the Dean to have an opportunity to ask questions of you, the students here at the Bush School. So, so both of those are uh, open uh, for the Q&A. I'm joined here by uh, Rebecca Leesman. Rebecca is the Student Government Association Leadership Chair, and so I invited her uh, to come as well. I know Ambassador uh, Crocker knows, needs no introduction uh, when they named the State Department's major award for expeditionary leadership after you. Uh, pretty much everybody knows who you are. Uh, it's been a great honor to uh, be able to host uh, Ambassador Crocker, uh, our dean, for uh, two of these sessions for the last uh, three or four years, and, and everyone has been very worthwhile. So we look forward uh, to your questions. I've asked Rebecca to start off with the first question today. First of all, thank you for joining us. We look forward to gaining insight about leadership specifically from you. Can you name a person who's had an impact on your life as a leader, and why and how did this person impact your life? I, I, I can name four different phases of my life. Um, uh, the first was my first grade teacher. Um, and think back about your own primary education. If, since you're well enough educated to be in this room, Somebody made a big difference early on, uh, and it's just worth thinking about who that person was, what they did. Miss um, Judd, um, uh, Valley Elementary School, Spokane Valley, Washington. Uh, uh, her enthusiasm, her interest uh, in her students uh, caught me right away. The one who got me reading, and there is a key to success anywhere, uh, is reading and writing. Uh, and the one always uh, But I took away from that again um, uh, enthusiasm and engagement with those she was leading. Uh, uh, in college, I had a professor of English literature. Who brought that same enthusiasm? Some might call it passion. Uh, he had a real passion for what he taught. I, I was already hooked as a, as a lit guy, uh, but that that sunk the hook even deeper. Deeper. Uh, uh, he cared about what he did. He cared that we understood why he cared and cared our own right. Uh, so again, the same qualities in that in him that I saw in my first leader. Uh, two other leaders were in the Foreign Service. Um, Richard Murphy, uh, many times an ambassador, I know Josh knows him, uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. Um, an incredible knowledge of the region. Uh, if you're going to lead, you've kind of got to know something about uh, uh, the subject of the field in which he was proposed to be. And he knew, he knew Arabic, uh, he knew the region, he knew the leaders, uh, he knew the poets, the philosophers, he just he knew it all. Uh, he had enormous respect for it. Uh, the same ability to empathize with those he led, uh, to wander around in the evening hours very state basically. We could talk about just dividing it up into shifts so we could go 24 hours a day with three shifts rather than 20 hours a day with one. <laughs> um, uh, he, just, he, he knew he knew what you were doing and cared about it. And, and his, his third attribute was um, an ability always to maintain balance and perspective. When the roof was absolutely coming down, he'd make a, 
a joke which may or may not have been funny, but the point was he made it uh, when they were looking for the fire exit. Um, so calm the fire. Uh, it was a big thing. Frank Wisner, um, also a many time ambassador, uh, conveyed different qualities, but was a fantastic leader. Uh, uh, Frank Wisner was highly operational. What's the issue, the goal, the objective? Um, how do we get it? Uh, he had an amazing capacity to think about five moves ahead. Um, if I do this, what's the response going to be? What's the range of responses? How do I respond to that? Uh, is it taking me where we need to go? He had an ability to define both strategic objectives and tactical steps to get there. And he did it in lightning speed. Um, uh, to say that he did not suffer fools gladly would be incorrect. He did not suffer them at all. Uh, uh, and we, we loved Richard Mur Murphy, and we respected him. Frank Wisner, we respected him. Mm -hmm. um, but it also taught me uh, that in leadership, particularly in crisis, situation, it is better to be respected than love. This is a little Machiavelli there. For, for <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in, in the past uh, four plus years, you've been able to uh, be in Bush School, associated with it during your absence in Afghanistan. You've also been uh, to the University of Virginia, as well as Yale in various capacities. And I appreciate that your, your first two uh, examples were teachers, so uh, that, that uh, gives us all hope. Uh, what, what is your impression of the schools of public and international affairs, the ones you've been intimately involved with and the ones you know about? Uh, are, are we doing a good job in, in educating and preparing uh, students for careers of public service, or are there certain weaknesses that you're observing? in terms of areas that we need to um, but the, the last is a question for all of you to answer when you're out there in the world. Uh, how did we do? Uh, uh, I'm here because I think we've got it right, both in our philosophy of, of uh, teaching and in the students we, we attract here. Uh, uh, Yale and the University of Virginia are obviously good schools. I could have uh, stayed at either one of them. But this is where I wanted to be, and it's in the name. Some of you have heard me say this before. We're, we're not a school of public affairs or public policy. Uh, we're a school of public service. And the overwhelming majority of our students I will not ask for a show of hands, not until crazy for them, <laughs> are, are here because they, you, are drawn to the concept of public service, uh, of, of serving a cause that is larger than yourself, by definition of being a leader eventually in, in the field you move into. Uh, you have that among the students I, I taught at, at Yale and at Virginia, uh, but not with the breadth and intensity that we have here. Um, you know, 41 lends its name to this place for a reason. It personifies public service, uh, uh, both um, corporately and uh, in government, both legislative and executive. <coughs> and as he says, it is a noble calling. That is the ethos that permeates this place, faculty and students. Uh, again, it is present everywhere, uh, certainly present present at Yale and um, uh, Virginia, but not as an overarching theme. Uh, if I had to sum this place up, it's easy, one word, service. You can't do that for Yale and Virginia, uh, even though that uh, those characteristics are very much there uh, among their, their students. But, uh, taught a seminar at Yale, a grad seminar, that was very close to one I taught here uh, on U.S. policy in the Middle East. So I got to look at apples and apples. 
And I, I found that my, my Bush school students, I, I would give uh, you know, a plus next to the grade I would give my Yale students. Uh, not because they were brighter necessarily, they were as bright, but because they were more committed. Even a non-academic uh, uh, lecturer can tell in a seminar in about five minutes uh, who's done the reading and thought about it and who hasn't. Uh, uh, that was never an issue for my seminar here. There would always be a, a percentage of the students at Yale who figured they could just wing it by glancing at the chapter heads and relying on their native brilliance. Uh, uh, nobody failed, but um, you know, some learned that a gentleman C in grad school is not quite gentlemanly or lady. Thank you. We're going to open it up to the audience now. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, questions out there. Let's start uh, all the way back. You, um, what is your view of um, the private sector in, in providing public service? Uh, we, we, whenever we talk about public service here in this school, normally we associate that with working for government. But, but what, what's the role of the private sector in providing uh, public service? It's a great question because government has fundamentally and profoundly changed since I entered it. A lot of governmental functions now are, of course, outsourced. Uh, and there is a debate uh, you know, going on as to whether work for a private entity that is working for the government, does that constitute public service? Well, to me, it's, it's a very easy question to answer. Yes, it does. Uh, if you are doing work previously done by um, full-time direct hire government employees, it doesn't matter who signs your paycheck. It's what you're doing. I, I will be going up uh, what's today, Monday, Wednesday, to uh, to Washington D.C. Um, for an event uh, that has as its audience uh, officers in a government agency, but it is organized by the Rand Corporation. Uh, now, the ones who are putting it together, they they all have security clearances. And they are they are doing a government function, uh, which is to bring some outside speakers in to interact on a particular issue with direct government employees. I, I spend time uh, with companies like Accenture, uh, uh, like IBM, and others to look for internship and indeed placement possibilities uh, for our students because they are doing governmental work. And it is not going to change. Uh, this will not snap back when all of a sudden government is flush with money again. Ever. But even if it is, uh, this is the world you're going to be dealing with. And uh, uh, what I have seen is a movement back and forth, where individuals will start out, say, with a company that has a government contract, then go into government directly, and then maybe move back to that company. And that, I think, is good all the way around. Uh, good for the individual, good for the government, good for the company, uh, because they then get different perspectives. Uh, I wish I had known a little bit more about how the private sector operates uh, when I was in government. I would have benefited from that. So I definitely don't see it as non-government service or second echelon uh, at all. It, uh, it kind of depends on what the position is and what the track forward is. But, uh, you know, do take a good look at companies that are providing government services as well as the government itself. Yes, there's a question. Yes. <clears throat> on Wednesday, last week, we had the opportunity to hear Secretary Levin speak, and he spoke a lot about bipartisanship. And I was wondering, since you've served so long, you've served in different administrations for Republicans and Democrats. What are your thoughts on bipartisanship, and how effective can a leader be if, like, if you're working across the aisle, or you know, the, the complications that come with that aspect of government? 
uh, you know, it's, it's a great question and a, a critical one for anyone thinking of going into public service. Public servants were not elected by the people. Uh, and it's very important to bear in mind that policy is made at one end of Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House, and is resourced at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, the Congress. All elected officials, the President and the members of Congress. And it's a short drive between the two, or it would be, but thinking of the Secretary LaHood, of course, the potholes are so bad on people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I found was absolutely necessary uh, in the Foreign Service, applies to any branch of public service, is that I, was in, I knew I was entitled to my own politics, but I also knew I was serving a commander-in-chief who is an elected leader. And you've got to sort that out pretty early in your life. Uh, are you able to work with complete loyalty, dedication, and diligence uh, for the person who has met uh, the people's test, regardless of party? Because if your own political views are so strong that you can't answer that question with an immediate affirmative, you might want to cross that divide think of a career in politics uh, rather than in public service. Uh, uh, I was an ambassador six times. Ambassadors are confirmed by the Senate. Nominated by a president, confirmed by the Senate. I served three times in Democratic administrations and three times in Republican administrations. Uh, uh, I grew up in the military, so I may have had a head start. For me, uh, once the order is given, you salute and you step forward. <clears throat> now you can quibble, moan, and advise otherwise until the order is given, and indeed you need to. Uh, when, when the policy is still up for debate, uh, your best advice and counsel is absolutely critical to political level decision makers. And more than a time or two, I've been in rooms with uh, political appointees of of a given administration who had a very distinctive political slant to their view on policy, which is entirely fair. Your job, if you are uh, a public servant, uh, not a political appointee, is to give your best advice regardless of the politics. Uh, and you can get right in their face on that. That is allowed. Uh, but once that decision comes down, uh, there is only one response. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so it's kind of important to wrestle that down in, in your own soul uh, before you make uh, a long-term career choice. So, looking beyond the negotiations with Iran, how does Iran's position in the Middle East affect uh, that's another excellent question. Uh, we are we are watching Iran on a roll. Uh, uh, in Iraq, I, I would argue in Syria, uh, in Lebanon, in Yemen, it's a little more complicated, but. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that the Iranians are doing really well in Yemen because their uh, so-called proxies, the Houthis, are doing really well in Yemen. Uh, but actually, the ties are not that uh, that tight. But nonetheless, Iran benefits from the impression. Uh, uh, so they have to be taken seriously. Uh, Iran is, <coughs> will be, has been. Uh, a regional heavyweight. And you take that far as you want, back into history. Uh, Sasanians, Safavids, the Pahlavis, and now the Ayatollahs. Uh, doesn't matter who rules in Tehran, uh, they are going to flex significant muscle. Uh, here's the leadership lesson of several of them. First, 
know your adversary uh, and be humble enough to know that you've got to do a lot of thinking, reading, and listening to understand your adversary. You kind of need to understand that adversary better than you understand your allies. <coughs> Costs are higher. Uh, it means you have to be a little bit humble. Uh, uh, you know, don't take your foreign policy off of campaign slogans. Uh, uh, the second thing is leadership itself. I, I would suggest to you, uh, there was an uh, interesting op-ed in yesterday's New York Times, um, uh, Obama's Middle East mess, that actually tried to give some coherence to a chaotic scene uh, with a discussion of uh, Pax Americana versus offshore balancing. Uh, that may give the administration more credit than it deserves, but it's still an interesting construct. But the issue, again, is leadership. Um, uh, you know, if one looks at the, uh, the last six years, and again, I was in the administration for, uh, for part of that, uh, this has been about leadership at home. Let the region or regions kind of take care of themselves and let our allies step up to it, which is a nice construct if it works. But as the uh, Times op-ed suggests, well, the conditions in the Middle East don't really allow for that right now. Uh, so we step back. Iraq is the clearest example of this. The Iranians step forward. Um, uh, there are very few vacuums in international politics those that seem to emerge are quickly filled by someone. Um, and what we're seeing in the region is, in many cases, those someones are not our friends. So you kind of have to, like Frank Wisner would do with Dick Murphy's area knowledge, take that knowledge and think five steps ahead uh, and then be sure your position that uh, uh, when that adversary comes over the ridge, uh, you're able to at least block. And this would be a great time, I think, for the United States to rethink where we are in the Middle East, what the currents that are determining events are, and how we can influence them, uh, at least to suffer no damage and, if possible, to make some gains. But all of that requires leadership uh, and engagement. And it's interesting to me that we're seeing uh, uh, Arab Gulf airstrikes into Yemen that we not only did not orchestrate, that we found out about uh, a couple of hours before they jumped off. Not sure that's a good place for the United States to be uh, when our allies are moving out without us, uh, let alone our adversaries. So it is about leadership. Can I make a plug here? Maybe you already teased this. Um, uh, uh, Nan Cohane's essay on leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, she later turned it into a book. Past president of uh, Wellesley and Duke, um, professor at uh, Princeton for many years. Uh, you can buy the book, which I, I think is called Thinking About Leadership, or you can just go online and get the essay, which really is a distillation of the book. Um, it, you know, for a practitioner, past present or future, I, I would commend that to you. Uh, and she writes, you mentioned Machiavelli, uh, uh, and indeed on leadership, the title uh, evokes Machiavelli. She really, she writes through his voice uh, without necessarily buying into his concepts. But it's a delightful read uh, uh, and uh, a, a good practitioner's handbook. She talks about that. Just thinking in times to... Yeah, I did. My, my, my field manual for all time is um, Roy Stott and May's uh, Thinking in Time. I, I have packed that sucker uh, in every crisis zone I've served in. Uh, pretty well have it memorized uh, because uh, actually, even if you know a book well, you've got to consult the index when the bullets are flying. It's probably a little late. So. <laughs> <laughs> Advisors can make or break a leader. What's your formula for success 
for picking the right people to surround yourself. Uh, advisors do make or break a leader. And, and when, I, when I was teaching U.S. policy in the Middle East, it, it really was, in addition to a history, it was a dissection of leadership types uh, and abilities. Uh, because for a presidential system, presidents make decisions. So their, their national security team is the one who tees up the issues for decisions. Uh, and we've got lots of recent instances when it's gone quite well. George H.W. Bush, probably the prime example, whether it was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the liberation of Eastern Europe, or the storm to deal with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Um, he had the dream team of advisors. We uh, brought them all of them to campus uh, in January 2011 for the 20th anniversary of Desert Storm. And it was stunning in what it revealed, not just what happened, but how it happened, who did what, who said what. And it comes down, ultimately, again, for a presidential system to the president. Who and how does the president choose to have as his <coughs> critical advisors? Uh, and that takes me to what I think is the single most critical component of leadership, good or bad, judgment. Um, and that's judgment in many dimensions. It's being, first, a good self-judge, which is horrendously uh, what are your strengths, more importantly, what are your weaknesses? Because it's in answer to the latter question, you then come to, well, who do I need around me uh, who can bring that dimension I may lack or that experience I didn't get? Um, uh, and George Bush did that incredibly well. Uh, but there is nothing wrong with having <coughs> dissenting voices among your leaders, and in fact, there's a great deal of right about it. You know, the first cabinet this nation had consisted of uh, four members uh, under George Washington. Two of them hated each other, absolutely hated each other, Hamilton and Jefferson. Uh, Hamilton went to the point of uh, buying a newspaper in New York so he would have a platform to editorialize against Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson you know, late one night, tried to get Washington to sign off on an appointment as Deputy Secretary of the Treasury that was a Jefferson ally and a Hamilton enemy. It didn't work. But, you know, Washington kind of liked it that way because it guaranteed that any issue that <clears throat> came up for a presidential decision would have been thoroughly uh, argued and vetted, conspired against, possibly, uh, <laughs> before it got there. Uh, you know, there is a huge danger, and I know you've, you've covered this in group think. Uh, so having the, the, the dissenting voice can be pretty important. Uh, so it's going to vary from president to president, but it is a presidential call, and the president has the ultimate responsibility for how well he or she chooses uh, those around him who will vet and tee up decisions give that tug on the sleeve saying, watch out for uh, what's about to land on your desk in 48 hours. Uh, that all comes from good judgments that lead to the selection of good people. Speaking of um, making decisions, what's one of the <coughs> hardest decisions you've had to make, and how did you evaluate the trade-offs when you were making that decision? Uh, probably the hardest decision I had to make came relatively early in my career. Uh, Beirut, Lebanon, late summer 1983. I was a political counselor, number three in the embassy after the ambassador and deputy chief of mission. Um, we were sitting in West Beirut, a, a militia uprising uh, the latter part of August basically pushed uh, government forces out of the western part of the city. The Civil War was raging at this point. Uh, it, it was a chaotic time. Uh, we had a group of American military advisors uh, working out of a hotel near the embassy compound, but not uh, joined to it. They were surrounded. 
Uh, the ambassador and deputy chief of mission were way off in another part of town. Uh, that was back in the days before cell phones. What a mercy it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I got the directive was get our advisors into our perimeter safely. And to do that, first I had to understand what was going on in that town. Uh, uh, who controlled the guns uh, in that particular area? And where did we have influence? So again, it's, it's knowledge. Uh, uh, you know, an indispensable uh, ingredient to any good leadership position. Uh, uh, it's relationships. You know, I have spent time not only dealing with uh, the national political leaders, but because uh, it was an unsettled uh, security environment, I wanted to know who militia commanders were right around the embassy. And, uh, so pay attention to relationships. Uh, one thing I did was to take uh, the uh, Progressive Socialist Party uh, regional commander, his deputy, and five or six of his top guns out for a visit to an aircraft carrier um, uh, about nine months before that. So when the chips were down, and these guys were out there with Kalashnikovs, RPGs, and with uh, stockings pulled over their faces, it was kind of like, hey, hey, Ryan, how you doing? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Still remember that trip to the aircraft carrier? Uh, uh, so I was able to work with them uh, to reach some of the really bad guys. They, they later became Hezbollah. Um, and we brokered a deal for the safe passage of um, our guys out of that building. Uh, judgment. I had to make the call. Okay, we got the deal. Can I trust that when we're really vulnerable, which is uh, when the vehicles pull out of one compound and head to another, can I trust the people there that they're not going to blast us away? Uh, the answer was I couldn't. Uh, because there were too many actors. I could trust the guys that I was working with. And because I trusted them, they trusted me. I said, we're going to do this in segments. Because my real fear was that when you've got three quarters of the force out, then they're going to descend on the remnant that's left. I said, I will be with every movement. Meaning, if you're going to go after them, you're going to have to kill me. Uh, so the abstract of military advisors became the personal of this guy we know. Um, obviously, it worked out all right because uh, here I am. <laughs> and, uh, there they are. But that was, you know, a, a, a situation that required relationships, it required knowledge, it required judgment, and it required making a call because you're never going to have all the facts ever. Uh, you've got to go with what you've got. Uh, when it's decision time, and and, uh, and be prepared to do that. And there is another indispensable quality of leadership, luck. <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know what Seneca said about luck? Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. Um, has there been any personal cost to memorizing such a successful professional? Um, yeah, uh, never had kids. You know, you can either um, move to the sound of the guns. You know, that's what I did from pretty much 1981 on. Um, or you can raise a family in a stable, secure environment. But I did not feel I could do both. Uh, uh, so you give up that. Uh, you give a, up a lot of what. Uh, we Americans consider the good things in life, and um, uh, I'm trying to make up for now. Uh, Aggies, baseball, 26 and one. Uh, uh, they're they're playing tomorrow evening at Bluebell. I'll be there uh, because I missed a couple decades worth of baseball seasons. <laughs> uh, 
you you give up a, a freedom of impulse for movement. Um, you know, from basically from 1990 on, when I was overseas, and that was almost all the time, I had security details. Uh, so nothing is ever spontaneous. You know, hey, I think we'll go down and grab a beer and you know watch. Uh, Watch Beirut beat Cairo in soccer. Well, you can't do anything spontaneously, and my cardinal rule was never do anything for fun. Uh, because your fun little excursion is going to put 20 or 25 men and women at risk because they're protected. Uh, and you may be at the point where you say to yourself, I am going stir crazy, I am going to go out and I'm going to kick back and I'm going to have a beer. Uh, I don't care when you killed. Well, maybe not, but you do care about those other 25. Uh, so yeah, you, you, know, you give up a few things. Um, uh, uh, to this day, even at a restaurant in College Station, I always sit back to the wall, facing the door. Uh, I want to know what's coming through. Uh, before I find it out with aces and eights. Uh, and uh, you haven't covered that in leadership seminars, and uh, you have overlooked how important <coughs> poker is to me. <laughs> uh, but all, for all of that, would I do it any differently now? No. No, I, I, um, I absolutely prize the career I had and the life I've led. Uh, it was pretty horrific sometimes going through it. Um, uh, my mantra is, you've heard it before, you will hear it here, you will hear it again. Go to hard places, do hard things, uh, whether in this country or abroad. Life is not measured in the number of trips to the mall. <laughs> uh, figure out where your comfort zone is and get outside of it. Uh, uh, that way when you reach, if you're lucky, uh, an advanced old age such as mine, and I was lucky, uh, it, you can think, well, you know, did it change history? Probably not. Uh, was I where it counted? Doing things that counted? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> yes. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for your service. Can you think of a time where you were given a leadership task and you had to manage people who not only you didn't get along with, but they didn't get along with each other, and you couldn't get rid of them, you couldn't fire them? How do you handle it? Well, the first, uh, the first thing is when you move into a leadership position, do the obvious. Figure out who you've got. You know, what's the organization chart? What are the personal dynamics within the organization? And how do you deal with it? Uh, it's kind of like my tale of Beirut. Uh, you need to do all the prep work uh, before the shit's really in the fan. Uh, then it's a little late. So figure out uh, where you may have personality conflicts. Uh, uh, work to harmonize those to the extent you can. And again, you've got to make the call. Uh, if you're in a situation where you expect you're going to have to make some sudden hard decisions and have people get in behind you, uh, kind of make your assessment beforehand. If you've got people who absolutely cannot or will not do that, um, uh, and then you've got to make the hard personnel calls of uh, sending somebody home or transferring somebody, and that's that's the backdrop against when you uh, when you make it. Uh, that if you are in a position carrying out a mission where things can go very far south all of a sudden, those above you will understand. If you say, I cannot depend on this team uh, when the real crunch comes. And I have moved people uh, before. Uh, the last thing you want to do is be dealing with a crisis and uh, your machine breaks under you. Uh, again, it, it depends on what you're doing. Uh, you know, if, if it's a non-crisis environment uh, where 
people's lives don't hang on it, well, then you're probably going to suffer longer and have less latitude uh, because you, you can't make some of those uh, personnel calls. And the other thing, of course, is organizational discipline. Uh, uh, I did not require that people liked each other. I certainly didn't require that they liked me. Uh, I certainly didn't like all of them. Uh, you know, but I was confident, as were they, as we tested it out, that uh, uh, when a decision was made, when a set of orders were given, uh, that there would be absolute compliance. Uh, uh, and they may not have liked me, but they had enough confidence in me to know that if I said, do it, uh, that I had worked my way through to this as the best or only uh, possible way forward, and they, they would do it. But again, it's, it's that preparation thing. Figure it out, and that applies to any organization. Not all of them are life and death, but all of them will have crises. Uh, figure out who you've got, what their dynamics are uh, in that honeymoon period when you first moved in, and any period of relative repose you get after that, uh, to be sure you've got it lined up uh, as best it can possibly be, so that you're never in a position where you would say, um, because of personality differences, we risk mission failure in whatever that mission is. Every, every leader has a mission. Every organization uh, uh, has missions. You define those, you look at your team, and if uh, that team means you cannot accomplish a mission, then you're going to have to figure out a way to change it uh, before you have failure. Thank you. Dean Parker, you've obviously taken on a great deal of responsibility in your career. Have you ever experienced self-doubt as you accepted a new role or assignment? And if so, how did you work through that? Uh, that's another great question. Uh, and this is open to debate, I suppose. I, I believe strongly that leaders are made. They're not born. Uh, a leader chips it out one hard experience after another. And with that comes something else that I believe. And a, a lot of my colleagues who have led, uh, including uh, military commanders in combat, that the leader and the person don't have to be identical. Uh, who you are as a leader doesn't have to be who you are as a person. Uh, now, the trick is, again, that thing we talked about earlier, self-knowledge. Know who you are. Uh, know what your nature and character are, and then know what leadership demands and what is required of a leader in your position. Uh, and there have been times, i got to tell you, uh, when the me that is Ryan Crocker uh, confronted with whatever hellish scenario it was, simply wanted to go sit in the closet with the light on and let somebody else deal with it or let it blow by and the world would still be here. Well, the leader that I was required to be could not do that. Uh, so you've got to step out of yourself uh, and, and be that leader. I mean, that comes in, in with, with reflection, uh, with an understanding of your organization, with an understanding of your missions, and with an understanding of the contingency. A good leader should never be completely taken by surprise. Uh, completely taken by surprise. Uh, uh, so you, you're kind of prepared for whatever comes through, through the door uh, at you. And if necessary, you've made the dichotomy that the, you know, that the, the real you is going to get some closet sitting time down the road when it's all quiet that will make you feel better. Uh, the you that is the leader is going to step up to it and, and, uh, and get it done. It's also, if you separate self from leader, when you're no longer a leader, uh, it's a much easier transition to make. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, if you could go back to the Ryan Cocker at 28 years old, what piece of advice would you give to yourself? Uh, let's see, that's going to require a higher path. <laughs> uh, 
uh, when I was um, when I was 28, uh, it was 1977, uh, and I was just getting to Baghdad, Saddam's Baghdad, uh, in the Foreign Service. What I learned real quick is what a true police state really is. Uh, and if you want to know how lucky you are as an American, or any from any nation in the free world uh, that's stable and secure, go be in one that is not free, not stable, and not secure. Uh, and you realize what an enormous gift you've got. So I had to learn it because I went to that kind of place. Uh, uh, I would have liked to have known it before, obviously, but again, uh, there are some things you only acquire through experience, uh, not, not through study. Um, uh, I certainly wish that I had been more like Dick Murphy, you know, the calm, uh, collected area specialist, and it was thinking of Dick Murphy that led me to what I did a few years later, which was go back to university uh, to get real smart on the Middle East, uh, because I hadn't been up to this point. Uh, so I wished, and I was conscious of this at the time, that I'd known more about where I was. Uh, uh, and I wished to heck I'd been a little less like Frank Wisner, that, that dynamic, incredibly fast-paced, often impatient uh, ambassador I served with later. Uh, but I wasn't quite so uh, judgmental and quite so ruthless in my expectations. Uh, you can only push people so far uh, to do so much. Uh, and Baghdad at that time was not a life and death post. Uh, uh, so accept that some people may not be as smart as you think you are, uh, or as quick, uh, maybe they're smarter in other ways that you're too dumb to figure it out. Um, at least admit the possibility. Uh, and understand that uh, uh, being a good leader is about instilling respect. And when, it's a, when it is a crunch, you know, uh, there is no more hand-holding. There is no more uh, hope you're having a nice day. Uh, uh, there is get out and get it done. Uh, but it's not always that way. And I wish I... It's still not uh, uh, an A student in patience. Uh, but I'm a lot better. I, I wish I'd gotten better so Let me ask a, a follow-on to that. Uh, Robert Gates, another uh, dean in Bush School of History, uh, when he was writing uh, his book, he, he pointed out that he, he spent a fair amount of his time in the recent, most recent post as Secretary of Defense going to National Security Council meetings and, and trying to teach history to the young staff of the National Security Council about things that have been tried and not worked before, different positions, etc. Uh, so in your case, uh, Ambassador, that's a very specific part of the world, Middle East, how are you able to talk back to Washington in a way that uh, helps to educate people there about not only what was going on, but about the cultural sensitivities involved, which are so difficult to manage. Um, well, probably the first thing is how you present a contrary view. <clears throat> Normally, you're not going to succeed in <clears throat> conveying uh, your point in a high-level, high-stakes deliberation if you start your intervention by saying, you idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Even if that's what you think, and even if that's what they are. The <laughs> uh, second, be sure you spend a lot of time uh, building a track record. Uh, they may not know you, but chances are, if you're in a high-level conclave, they will know of you. Uh, so be sure that you're getting it right as you go along and as you go up. Uh, that when they look at your record, uh, they will say, this is somebody we may not agree with, but we should take seriously. So, you know, it's a gradual incremental process, not, not unlike academia. Uh, uh, you know. Third, 
be sure that you have factored in what you don't know, uh, and that you don't present something unless it is absolutely black and white, very little is in the government, uh, that, that you inject the nuance. Uh, this is the way I see it. These are the reasons I see it this way. Here are the courses of action. Here are their probable consequences. But, a big but, uh, I don't know at all. It gives you, it gives you credibility because, trust me, you won't know at all. Uh, uh, and second, it will probably bring in a more complex, nuanced discussion than may have been held up to that point. Uh, particularly if you're right and they know you're right, uh, but they don't quite want to acknowledge that openly. You start rounding round the edges a bit, bring people into the discussion uh, and into the decision. How about the, the, the cultural part of it? I mean, were you ever bluntly asked questions about Arab culture and, and having to overcome the stereotypes? Uh, I, I would have welcomed such a question. Uh, normally, what I got was uh, uh, convictions that were really prejudices in disguise uh, that did not willingly admit, that even though they had never lived in the Middle East and spoke none of its languages. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't really know any of its people, they knew everything about the region. Uh, the trick is dealing with people like that. Uh, uh, and, and there again, your, your own credibility and your ability to project um, assessments based on background, based on experience, based on knowledge, in a way that doesn't come across as saying, you mindless jerk. I've been out in the field, and you pretend to know. Why don't you take 20 bucks and go to the movie? This isn't going to work. Uh, so, you know, there's the arrogance of knowledge, uh, uh, the arrogance of experience, if you will, avoid that. And that, that's it. I don't know if you touched on it here. I know you have uh, your, your other uh, uh, sessions. Uh, humility is so important. Uh, yes, you've got to project authority, uh, you've got to uh, project conviction, certainty when necessary. Uh, but an attitude of humility is not only a great way of dealing with uh, bureaucratic uh, rivals, uh, it's a very important way of developing a knowledge. Uh, but what does humility mean? It doesn't mean that uh, you're down on your knees all the time engaged in acts of self-abasement, uh, not at all. Uh, it, it means that you're not completely focused on yourself. Uh, I mean, that's how you get the knowledge, by understanding that you don't know uh, everything there is to know about the world or a particular place in it. And therefore, you are going to listen, you are going to ask questions, you are going to read, you are going to educate yourself. Uh, and the same with people. Uh, relationships, as I said, are key. Uh, but relationships are with adversaries as well as allies. How well do you know your adversary? Where is your adversary coming from and why? Uh, maybe you're going to come to a, uh, an agreement. Maybe you're not. And if it's going to be something other than an agreement, like a confrontation, you want to know your adversary as well as you possibly can in order to defeat him. Uh, that has its roots in humility. I think Rob McDyer had uh, the last question today. So since this is the last um, lessons in leadership and our, our final discussion, most of us are moving now into the real world, be that in a career or some type of job or an internship. Is there anything that you want to talk about today that we should know going forward out into the real world as emerging leaders to continue our careers and, and to, um, to improve public service? Wow. <laughs> that, that's the whole year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I get this question sometime uh, uh, about people who say they're interested in the Foreign Service because they want to be an ambassador. Not a good mindset to have going on. Uh, uh, all of you, no matter how brilliant and talented you are, <clears throat> And if you are brilliant, brilliant and talented, otherwise you would not have gotten in here, let alone getting out. 
there's a great deal of uh, uh, hard-earned experience and a whole lot left to be learned before you're going to be ready for a senior leadership position. So, you know, I, I do see this sometimes even among foreign service officers who think, oh damn, I shouldn't be on the visa line. Uh, I should be telling the ambassador what he needs to do. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no. Uh, I mean, any ambassador who is smart enough to become one, uh, that would be the last person you're going to listen to for advice. So just be, be modest about what you do know uh, and always be figuring out how you learn more. And it's not just academic learning, it's experiential learning. Uh, put yourself in positions. Uh, that are going to test you, challenge you, and develop you. Uh, the military adage is never volunteer for anyone. Volunteer for everything. Uh, 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 it, it, it'll expose you to something new, something different. Uh, it, will, um, it, it will lead to your growth. Uh, second, values are important. Rigidity is absolutely to be avoided. And that can be more difficult than it may sound. Uh, be guided by your values. All leaders have them. The best leaders are, are true to their values at all times. Uh, but don't let your values become dogma, uh, because leadership is often about compromise. Uh, it compromise within goes back to the point on uh, dealing with difficult people, if you will. Uh, uh, even though she is a completely wrong-headed, uh, uh, opinionated and unreasonable person, maybe she's got a point. Figure out what it is. So avoid rigidity. Uh, uh, another point would be positivism. Uh, I, I have another little mantra. Uh, uh, hope requires perseverance. Perseverance doesn't require hope. Sometimes you just have to put your head down and keep going, even though you sense failure. Uh, and again, uh, Dr. Sarami has probably exposed you to this. Military annals are full of some of the best leadership examples you'll ever see are leadership in defeat. Um, how, how commanders facing defeat comport themselves. Uh, in, in the very best ways, even when faced with catastrophe, Projected a sense of positivism, not oh my God, this is happening to us. Run for your lives if you can. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, okay. Here is what we can do now. Here's what we need to do now. Here's what we need not to do. Now. Uh, positivism in the worst circumstances uh, is not only possible but necessary. Find a way to project it, uh, and that means up as well as down. Uh, you know, leaders like subordinates who've got a positive attitude. And that is not, again, it's all sunshine, uh, uh, it's all light. It's, well, and positivism is probably most important uh, uh, when the stuff's really coming at you. Uh, to, to have somebody a few, uh, uh, a few echelons down say, uh, oh, I think we can do this, or I think we can do that, it can make a heck of a lot of difference. And it can certainly make your name. Uh, 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 when the citations are handed out after the battle, so that you're still around. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, uh, <laughs> that's what I said about you know not killing the really. I mean, uh, you know, so so all of those qualities, uh, uh, that sense of humility, that uh, uh, essential quality of judgment, uh, uh, of positivism, of, of values not becoming dogma uh, and being open to compromise, humility that lets you understand where someone else is coming from, uh, subordinate ally or adversary. All of those are pretty key, uh, it would be for me, to, uh, uh, to take with you as you, as, uh, uh, you head into the world. Thank you. Well, we're out of time, and I uh, appreciate your attendance and your very good questions. Uh, thanks to Rebecca Lisa for joining me up front here. In the spotlight, and uh, Holly Castle has uh, arranged for pizza and uh, drinks for you on the way out the door.
uh, let me say it's truly really been an honor to uh, serve here at the Bush School with uh, Ron Crocker. Uh, he's always been uh, a giving uh, person. He's never uh, been uh, at all hesitant to step in and, and meet with students or meet with groups in the community and, and project an image and really represent uh, our school and keep it with the highest ideals of the President's Section 39. So on behalf of the Assembly Group, I want to thank you for your service to the Bush School today. Thank you.